before, so hopefully it works. Um, but yes, welcome, exam two review. Um, so this is just going to be kind of like going through some of the things that might be on the exam. It's not going to be comprehensive, um, right? So not everything from this review can be on the exam. Oops, I gotta stick over here by the mic. Sorry, people online. Not everything from this review will be on the exam and not everything on the exam will be in this review. Best study method, I would say, is to rework old problems. So if, you know, rereading your notes can be helpful, watching videos can be helpful to fill in gaps, but the best way to study is to do problems because on the exam, you're gonna have to do problems. So you wanna practice that. Um, rereading your notes, yeah, it's helpful, but it's not the best. Um, and then studying with others is always a really good really good uh, study tip that I have. Okay, so let's jump right in. So this says, what kind of reaction is the following reaction? And your choices are combination, decomposition, or combustion. What do you guys think? Combination, combination. yeah, why? <clears throat> We're taking two things and smushing them together, right? Combining them to make one uh, compound, yeah. So this one is combination, yeah, combination. Questions about that? Just stop me anytime if you have any questions. <clears throat> okay, what is the oxidation state of magnesium on the product side of the following reaction? So remember, product side is which, which side here? The right side, right? So you want to know, okay, what is the uh, oxidation state on magnesium here? Magnesium. So remember the oxidation state for what, what type of compound is this? Let's actually start there. Is it ionic, covalent? It's ionic. How come? How'd you know that? It's a metal and a non-metal, right? So there's a metal there, so it's uh, we know it's ionic. And when uh, it for an ionic compound, we have uh, charges on our ions, right? What's the charge on magnesium when it forms an ion? plus two. So what's the oxidation state? Plus two, right? The oxidation state is equal to the charge on your ion. So this one is plus two. Just for funsies, I didn't ask you it, but what's the oxidation state of magnesium on the reactant side? Zero, yeah. Zero because it's just, just alone. It's just in its elemental state. It hasn't bonded with anything, so it's just got a zero oxidation state. Yeah. Um, no, so the, the number in front, is that what you're looking at? Yeah, that number in front doesn't uh, factor into your oxidation state. So you're just looking at the charge on the individual ion. So since magnesium's in group 2A, it would rather lose two electrons to be like the previous noble gas than gain electrons. So it's going to lose two, forming a, a plus two charge. Yeah. So just the charge on the individual ion. Um, so what is the charge on O2 over here on the left? Zero, no charge, right? Because oxygen is one of our special diatomic molecules, right? It exists as O2 in nature. Anything in its elemental state, natural state, is just a zero oxidation state. What's the charge on oxygen over here on the uh, products? Two minus, right? Or minus two. So if we look at magnesium here, right? Did it gain or lose electrons? Lost, two electrons, right? What, is, what do we call the loss of electrons? oxidation and then oxygen if one thing was oxidized the other thing better be reduced so uh, let's double check it went from zero to negative two did it gain or lose electrons gained to gain two right so this was reduced Does that make sense okay I think the next slide is just showing those numbers um, and then this one says balance the following chemical equation maybe we could oh I bet we better do it on here for the uh, folks watching from home. Um, so maybe we'll, I didn't leave myself a whole lot of room here. I guess we'll rewrite it down here. All right, first step, list all of the atoms that you have. They better be the same on both sides. Then you want to count how many atoms you start with. 
right? So assuming we have one of everything, we have uh, how many sulfurs on the left? Just one, yep. How many uh, fluorines? Four. How many hydrogens? Two. How many oxygens? Just one, yeah. On the right, how many sulfurs? One. How many fluorines? One. How many hydrogens? One. And how many oxygens? Two. Yeah, you guys got it. Okay, so is this balanced? No. What do we have to do? Are we allowed to change these here, these numbers here? No, we are not. So, um, well, how do I get rid of that? So what can we change? The coefficients, right? Just the stuff in front, these numbers here. Um, so what do we want to change first? Anybody got any ideas? HF, make it what? Four, make it four. So that changes, we got a bookkeep, right? So that's going to make this four, and that makes our fluorine four as well. Um, are we done? No, what do we need to change now? H2O, so that's got to be a two, right? We're going to make that a two. That makes this four, right? Two times two is four. That makes the oxygen what? Two. Beautiful. All right, now we are balanced. So that is, which one is that, A? A? Yeah. Makes sense? You guys with me? Sweet. All right. What's the molar mass of ethanol, C2H60? How do we get the molar mass? Oops, sorry. C2. Add it all up, right, from the periodic table, keeping in mind how many of each uh, atom we have. So we have how many carbons? Two. What's the mass on each carbon? Yeah, 12.01. What are my units? I started writing it. Grams per mole, yeah. Uh, sweet. All right. How, how about hydrogen? We have six of them. What? Yeah, 1.008 grams per mole. How many oxygens? Just one lonely oxygen. The mass on that is 16 grams per mole. Now you got to add all that up. Multiplying first, right? And then add it all up. Um, let's see here. What do we get? You guys get a number for there? For, for, the, for there. For that, yeah. Yeah, 46. Oops, 46 point. Did you say one? Or, or zero 07, yeah. We'll go zero 07, and then our units are grams per mole, right? Not AMUs, right? Don't let it trick you here. We're in grams per mole, molar mass. Remember, connecting moles and mass, which is usually measuring grams, right? So it's going to be A. You guys with me still? Sound good? Not too bad? All right, the next one, convert 1.54 moles. Uh, to, uh, oh, sorry, 1.54 moles of C2H60 to grams. One I'll let you guys try that out. Me dropping things everywhere. Okay, C. Oops. C two H six. Oops. Alright, what do you think? Where are we going to put moles? On the top or the bottom? Bottom. How come? 
want to cancel it out. So what do, how many moles do I put down here? Yeah, one mole of C2H60 is uh, weighs how much? Yeah, 40, whoops, whoa, that's not the right color. Oh, that's the highlighter. 46, what was it? 46, okay, grams, C2H60. Um, did anybody get a number out of that? 70.9 grams of C2H60. Um, yeah, you guys already rounded to three sig figs, which is great, right? Why three sig figs? That for our measure value, right? That's three sig figs here. Uh, this is four here. So we need three sig figs in our final answer. Yeah, nice job. Uh, here I have another. I think I got a slightly higher answer. I rounded a little differently, but same idea. All right, next one is converting grams to atoms. So 3.14 grams of aluminum to atoms of aluminum. That's a L, not an I, so it's aluminum. Can you go straight from grams to atoms? No, you gotta go so through something first, right? That's a, I, I have a little hint on the board for how many steps you'll need. All right, what do we want to get to first? Moles, right? What connects grams of aluminum to moles of aluminum? Molar mass. Molar mass, yeah. So what is the molar mass for aluminum? 26.98 grams, whoops, grams of aluminum. Goes on the bottom because we want to cancel it out, right? What goes on the top? One mole of aluminum, yeah. Cancel out those grams of aluminum. Awesome. Now we're in moles of aluminum, but we want atoms. What connects moles and atoms? Avogadro's number. So do we want moles on the bottom or the top? Bottom. One mole of aluminum is what? 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms, molecules, puppies, dogs, cats, whatever, of aluminum. Oops, aluminum. Never give myself enough room here. Yeah, so you got to take now uh, everything on the top, multiply it all together, and then divide by whatever's on the bottom. Um, so let's see what that is. I think I actually have it on the next slide. I got 7.01 times 10 to the 22nd atoms of aluminum. If you got somewhere in that ballpark, that's totally fine. I think I would be able to figure out a table that you have to, to do this. Um, why such a big number? There's a lot of atoms, yeah. Even in a small amount of matter, right? There are a lot of atoms there. They're really, really, really tiny. Um, I have exact in quotes here. Uh, remember, uh, Avogadro's number is considered exact, okay? So you don't need to worry about sig figs for that one. So when we're calculating sig figs on this one, we're going to look at the usually the first value, which is your measured value. Um, four sig figs on your... Uh, Molar mass, yeah, words. So three sig figs need to be here at the end. Sound good? All right, let's keep going. So a chemist starts with two moles of hydrogen and three moles of oxygen. Use the balance equation to determine the limiting reactant. Limiting reactant. Now remember, with limiting reactants, if I don't ask you for how many grams you made, you don't have to go all the way to grams, right? You can just go to moles. If you get to moles for both of those, right, um, 
you should be able to figure out which one's the limiting reactant. All right, how do we get from moles of one substance to moles of a totally different substance? Balanced equation, yeah, which tells you your mole ratio, right? Um, so in this balanced equation, two moles of H2 go in and one mole of oxygen goes in and we get out two moles of H2O. So we can make conversion factors for each of these relationships. So for the first one, I've split it up into two equations here, right? Because for limiting reactants, we want to know which one of our reactants is limiting how much of our product we can make. What's our product here? Water, right? So I want to know, hey, from H2, how much H2O do I get? Or from O2, how much H2O do I get? And then I want to compare which one makes the least amount. That's your uh, limiting reactant. So for H2, what's the ratio between H2 and uh, H2O? Yeah, it's two to two. So two moles of H2 go in and two moles, sorry, moles with an S, of H2O come out. In other words, one to one, right? Those two are, twos are going to cancel. Two to two ratio is the same as a one to one ratio, right? So these are going to cancel. Moles of H2 cancel and then even these twos cancel. And we're left with two moles of H2O produced. That's how much water we can make from our first reactant. Now we want to compare that, okay? How much water can I get out from my other reactant? Well, uh, what's the ratio here? O2 to, to H2O. Yeah, one to two. So one mole of O2 goes in and two moles of H2O come out. So I'm going to get three times two is six moles of H2O. So it just so happens, well, let me ask you this first. Which one is our limiting reagent then? H2, right? H2 is our limiting reagent. We cannot make six moles of H2O because we're going to run out of H2 first, okay? If you need both of those things to react in a container to make your product and we run out of one of those things, you can't make any more, right? So that's our limiting reactant. So H2 is limiting reactant. Um, and then what did I want to ask you guys? Uh, oh, I just wanted to mention that. Notice um, in this example here, we start with two moles of H2 and three moles of oxygen. So it's tempting to look at the lower number and say, oh, well, that's going to be my limiting reactant. The problem with that is it's not always going to work out this way, right? Where it's it's your lowest amount that you're starting with that's actually your limiting reactant. Sometimes you might start with 15 grams of one thing and 10 grams of the other thing, and the one that's limiting is actually the 15 gram one. Okay, so you can't just look at those numbers and say, oh, the lowest one is limiting. You got to use those ratios first. Does that make sense? Okay, um, great. Let's keep moving along here. Now, using your answer to the previous question, how many grams of water can you make? In other words, what's your theoretical yield? Right? Your theoretical yield only comes from your, uh, your, your limiting reactant. Yeah. 
in the in You're in moles of water, right? And you want to get to grams of water. What connects grams and moles? All right, let's take a look. So um, I know I'm going kind of fast, but I want to get to the new stuff as well, um, just because I'm noticing you guys seem to have this a really good grasp on this. So we start with two moles of water. That was how much we could make, right? Not the six moles. We can't make that much. We'll run out of H2 first. So we start with two moles of water, and then we want to get to grams of water. The only thing co that connects grams and moles is your molar mass. So we got to get the molar mass of water. Calculate that, do your multiplication, and you get 36.04 grams of water. Um, I think if we were taking into account sig figs from one of the previous slides, let me take a look. Oh, I can't go back. Oh, it won't let me go back. Sorry. I think if we were taking into account sig figs, it wouldn't be four here, but that's okay. Just, just don't worry about it for now. Does that make sense? So I could have asked if uh, if you started out with some number of grams of H2 or O2, how much, how many grams of water could you make? And you can do that all in one big problem. It's just going to be a four stepper, right? Um, or you'll have four train tracks, um, just like your your pod, pod 10, I think it was. Questions about this? So if this is your theoretical yield and you make uh, some other number. In lab, you can also get your percent yield, right? Right? Oh, I thought I had a question about that. I don't. But yeah, you can get your percent yield as well. Okay, so what quantity of heat is transferred when a 30 gram block of iron is heated from 37 degrees Celsius to 55 degrees Celsius? And what is the direction of the heat flow? For this one, I've given you the equation you're going to use, but I would practice trying to figure out what equation you need. And the best, there's even some practice problems in your textbook on this that are really good. What's kind of your clue, though, from this from this question that you're going to need the the heat transfer equation? Yeah, there's a temperature change, right? We see two different temperatures. Another thing is I say heat is transferred, not heat, like how much heat is needed to melt, right? Or vaporize, those would be different ones, right? Different equations. But yeah, the, the, I think the easiest way is to look at your, your temperature values. All right, so do we have our mass? Yeah, we have a mass, right? So our mass whoops, is 30 grams. Uh, do we have our C value? Yeah, we can get that from the chart here. Um, so what is our C value? 0 0.108 um, calories per gram times degrees Celsius. Don't let those units freak you out, right? We're going to cancel a bunch of them. And then what's our delta T? We got we to gotta solve that one, right? So delta T is equal to our final temperature, or TF, minus our initial temperature, or TI. What's our final temperature? 55, right? We heated this up, right? And our initial is, whoops, 37. Sorry, it's looking at my mass there. 37 degrees Celsius. Um, so 55 minus 37. 18 degrees Celsius. So that is going to be our delta T. So that goes here, 18 degrees Celsius. And now your job is to multiply all that stuff out. We're going to cancel out those grams because we have them in the numerator and the denominator here. We also have degrees Celsius in the numerator and the denominator. And then we're just going to be left with calories, which is great because that's a unit of heat. Um, okay, just for quick quickness sake, I'm going to go to the next slide uh, where I have already figured this out. I got 58.3 calories 
Oh shoot, oh, I didn't mean to show you the last part yet. But thinking about the direction of the heat flow, what, uh, there's a lot of different ways to say this, right? So on your exam, as long as I know that you understand where that heat is going, we're good. So I said, you know, 58.3 calories added into the system. By system, I mean, you know, the thing that we're heating, the iron block, right? If you said added to iron, that works. If, yeah, Catherine. So if it was an iron number, it becomes very, uh, Yeah, removed from... Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, you got it. Yeah. Yeah. So the question was, if it's if it's a negative number, um, what does that mean? So if it's negative, that means you're removing that heat from the system or heat is being released. If it's positive, that means you're adding heat into the system. Does that make sense? Yeah, there are lots of other ways you could say this, right? As long as I know that you know where that heat is going, uh, that's good. Now, the way that you would get a negative number here is only from your temperature change, right? You can't have a negative mass. We can't have a negative C value. So the only thing determining that negativity for that last value is your delta T. If your delta T, if you're subtracting a small number from a big number, that's going to be negative. So uh, you'll get a negative number at the end. All right, the la I think this is the last one, actually, which is cool. Um, what is the enthalpy change for this reaction, and is it exothermic or endothermic? First off, what the heck do those terms mean? What's exothermic? Heat's released. Heat's released, right? Endothermic is what? Yeah, right? Absorbed, right? He is absorbed. So exothermic, we're, we're giving off heat, releasing heat. Heat is exiting our system, right? Endothermic is being absorbed. You're absorbing that heat. Heat is going into your system. Endothermic reactions uh, are going to feel cold in your hand, and exothermic reactions are going to be hot, okay? So if you pick up a a test tube and it's an endothermic reaction that's occurring, that'll be cold. If you pick up a test tube that's hot, that means an exothermic reaction occurred. All right, so um, is this what I wanted to? Yeah, yeah. This one. Yeah, this one's actually kind of hard. This is in your textbook. You got to figure out what bonds you have here. Yeah, so, so you kind of got to do some loose structures actually. Sorry for that wonky chart on there. I, I had to cut and paste a little bit. <laughs> All right, what's your Lewis structure look like for H2? It's an H bonded to an H in a what? What type of bond? Yeah, just a single bond, right? Um, so I'm just rewriting it with our bonds kind of visible so we can see it. What about bromine? Bromine bonded to another bromine. What's that look like? Another single bond, right? Can't forget our other electrons here, but, but we're just looking at the uh, bonds that are breaking for this. Now we're going to make HBr. What, what, what does that look like? Just a single bond, right? And then keeping in mind, right, I heard someone say it, that you have two of them. Yeah. Sorry, I, that's kind of small. But you guys get the idea, right? We've got two HBr molecules that are being formed here. Okay, so we need to make sure that we account for both of those. When we are breaking bonds, does that take energy or release it? Does it require energy or release it when we break bonds? It requires energy, right? We gotta put energy in to break those bonds. So which bonds are breaking here? The left or the right? The ones on the left, right? The, this one's gotta break and this one's gotta break. So we have to put energy in to break those bonds. And then over here, are we forming bonds or breaking them? 
we're forming them, right? This is after the reaction, right? That's what that arrow means. So after the reaction, we have formed two new bonds. Uh, and so energy is going to be what? Uh, absorbed or released? Yeah, released. It's weird. I know. But just remember, when we form those bonds, that there's a release in energy, okay? There's a release in energy. Okay, so let me get rid of some of this writing here. Um, okay, so for our hydrogen bond up at the front, hydrogen bonded to hydrogen, how much bond energy, what's, how much energy is that going to take to break it? Yeah, 105 kilocalories per mole, right? Then we've also got this bromine by bromine bromine bond, which is what? 46 kilocalories per mole. We're getting these from this table to the left, right? Uh, or I should say correct. <laughs> and then on the right, we've got two molecules being formed. So I'm going to put a two there so I don't forget. There are two of them. And then each of those bonds uh, takes how many kilocalories per mole break to form? Sorry, what is it? 87. 87 kilocalories per mole times two. Okay, so remember, we now have to use that, that funky equation that looks like this, right? Some bonds broken minus some bonds formed. Do you guys remember that one? Kind of small, sorry. I don't know why I'm writing so small today. <laughs> but it says the sum of the bonds broken minus the sum of the bonds formed. Okay, so which bonds are broken here? Left or the right? The left. So our enthalpy of reaction equals 105 plus 46. Sweet, 151, thank you. Uh, kilocalories per mole. And then uh, that's subtracted from 2 times 87, 174, thank you, 174 kilocalories per mole. All right, are we going to have a negative number or a positive number? Negative, negative right? Specifically, 151 minus uh, 174. That gives us negative 23, right? So is this endothermic or exothermic? Yeah, exothermic. There's no trick in you guys. Yeah, exothermic. How did you know? Negative sign. Yeah, that negative sign tells us we are releasing that much energy. We have released that much energy. You could also think of this mathematically, right? If you look over here... This number, the amount it takes to form uh, those bonds, when bonds form, they release energy, right? So if that number is bigger, you're going to release energy. Kind of weird, right? Okay. Does that make sense, though? I think I have a couple more slides. Oh, I, okay, yeah, I do have another slide. So which intermolecular forces, kind of switching gears here, this is the very beginning of chapter 8, right? And this is the last thing that's going to be on your exam. So nothing else from chapter 8 is on your exam. So uh, which intermolecular forces do the following molecules exhibit? So N2, N2. So let's actually do this one together because we just learned this. Whoa. Oh, that's my highlighter. Again. Get off of there. No, not where. We're just not going to erase? Okay. N, no. Oh my gosh, sorry you guys. And third time's the charm. Okay, and and two. Is that a uh does it what what does it let me rephrase this, sorry. I just short circuited. Is this gonna exhibit London dispersion forces? Yes, absolutely. So we gotta list that, right? London dispersion. Any of these, the first thing you're gonna list on your paper is London dispersion. I don't wanna see any blank exams for this. London dispersion all the way. Um, okay, what's the next thing? Anything? Is there dipole dipole here? Something bonded to itself. No, right? No dipole because they have the same electronegativity value, right? They both want fries the same amount, so they are actually going to share equally. What about hydrogen bonding? No, no hydrogen bonding, right? There's no hydrogen there. So just London dispersion for that one, which is uh, what? Strong, weak? Weak. That's a weak force, right? All right, what about HBr? What does it have? London dispersion, yep. What else? 
Anything? Dipole, dipole. Yeah, how come? Yeah, bromine is really, really happy with more electrons, right? So bromine's going to ho hog all those fries, hogging all those electrons to that side of the molecule, which is going to create a permanent dipole. Why didn't we know that bromine hogs electrons, though? How did we know that? Yeah, it's further to the right on the periodic table. Even though it's lower than hydrogen, it's way further to the right. And we said as you go right and up on the periodic table, the electronegativity increases. Okay, so yeah, bromine is going to have a higher electronegativity value. So there will be a dipole there. Um, what about H bonding, hydrogen bonding? No, but there's a hydrogen there. It's not on the phone, though, right? Remember, hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen has to be bonded to some uh, fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. It's not on the phone here, so no hydrogen bonding. Don't let it trick you that there's a hydrogen there. Okay, still not capable. Okay, NH3. What does it? What does it have? LD. Yeah, London dispersion. Absolutely. What about dipole? Yeah, yeah, we think so, right? Why? Nitrogen is pretty electronegative, right? It's way over there on the right and up on the periodic table, so yep. Definitely dipole, dipole. Different. It really, really wants electrons. It's going to hog them. What about uh, hydrogen bonding? Yeah, hydrogen's on the phone here, right? It's on uh, nitrogen, right? So yes, H bonding. So of all of these, which one do we think has the highest boiling point where we have to put lots and lots of energy in to get it to boil? NH3, I thought that was going to be tricky. Yeah, NH3, because it has all of these uh, intermolecular forces. So in order to get that to boil, we've got to put in lots and lots of energy to overcome those forces. 